he is talking about problems, the really big problems, and I hope that he will also give us some hint on how to face these problems. And his t-shirt is the best cheat sheet for me because here I can read how he wants to uh, address these problems, I guess, via collaboration. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. In 2009, I was on a plane. That's a pretty common occurrence for me. I've got three million miles on American Airlines. I've been around the world in lots of different places. And sitting next to me on the plane was Kim Walesh. Kim is the head of economic strategy for the city of San Jose, California. City of San Jose is a little smaller than Vienna. It's a big city for America. It's about a million people. So it's a little smaller than Vienna, but it's still a fairly sizable city. And this is 2009. And if you might remember, in 2008, we had a massive global recession. And Kim was talking about the city. And of course, I'm talking about innovation games and, and talking about the kinds of things we do. And we're getting to know each other. And there's that moment that happens in your life when someone says something and it, your life kind of like in an instant, but your brain slows down like a car crash. You know what I'm talking about? Like that moment? I call that bullet time. And so what I want to lead you through is what changed my life in that moment. Kim said the city was $100 million dollars in debt, a hundred million dollars. I run a business and businesses can't run in debt. We actually have to make money. We have to actually survive. I couldn't get my head around this. So the first thing I thought was, huh? <laughs> and then, right, this is crazy. Like, oh, like what? And this is still going in my head in just a minute. And I thought, okay, Innovation games and collaboration techniques have been used by cities, I'm sorry, by used by companies around the world. In fact, um, uh, uh, Cisco's a client. So there's, there's lots of clients that we have around the world. And we prioritize features in debt and, and tech debt and things like that. And I thought, hey, we could prioritize a city budget. So of course, without thinking, as my wife would point out, I said, we can help. <laughs> Kim said, okay, that's great. I know you're this guy with this book, games, we don't play games. <laughs> We're not going to do that. And I thought that's okay because that's how I felt because I realized what I had just said. I don't know how to help a city do $100 million. And Kim said, don't worry about it because we have a community-based budgeting process that the mayor runs where they bring citizens into a room and they talk about the city budget. I'm thinking, hey, I'm an agilist. And that sounds like the value of customer collaboration over contract negotiation, which makes me, and I'm a former board member of the Agile Alliance, and I actually helped form the first Agile conference way back in 2003 with Ken um, and Alistair. So I'm thinking, gosh, this makes me super happy. And I say, Kim, you know, uh, you know how does this work? And she says, why don't you come and find out? I'm like, okay, I'll come to the meeting. So this is the best picture I have of that first meeting where uh, it's from a grainy kind of video that the city had. And you can see there's Kim and there's me and I'm just kind of walking around. Now what they did was they did PowerPoint and then they gave each of the residents a roll of nickels, a dollar of nickels. And they had five glass jars. And what you did was you put your nickels into the jar based on the priority that you were interested in. Like, you know, safety, public safety, or parks, etc. Well, this is a survey, and surveys suck. And what I mean by that is, if what you're building is shoes, then a survey is fine, because shoe size is a personal thing, and, and the, the shape of your foot is not affected by someone else's opinion of your foot. But when you're dealing with budgets, you, what you find in, in other areas is that the opinion that you have is actually shaped and informed by the opinions, by the opinions of others. You actually care 
about this. I wrote a blog post about this. Budgets are not broccoli. And when we approach budgeting in a tough, uh, you know, rational way, we fail. In fact, McKinsey wrote a book called The Alchemy of Growth, where we talk about how you structure investments over time. And McKinsey writes, any good team will create these many ideas with this much money to fund it. And after a while, ROI analysis can only get you so far. And the only way to make the final choice is to leverage the passions and interests of the team. Find out what they want to do based on these good economic choices. So if McKinsey is saying this kind of stuff, we got to do something different than a survey. So I said, Kim, that was fine, but how about let's make that a collaborative experience as opposed to just a survey? So Kim said, well, what's that mean? And I said, well, you know, collaboration starts with a goal. It's something that you want to achieve. And there are resources so that we know how to go about achieving the goal along with a field of play or a space of play that we can use to accomplish the goal. Now, we do need to know how to use those resources, so we need a set of rules. We need to know what's the proper behavior in engaging in this activity. We need a way to keep score or a feedback mechanism. And finally, we have this curious thing where we kind of want people to want to do this. We have this concept of voluntary participation. And of course, I've just described a game. And there's lots of games in the world. And the kind of games that we design and we create are serious games. So a serious game is simply a game. Uh, some people are nodding. You like the movie, right? Yeah, that's good. Uh, I forgot. I, I, my kids are now old enough that I watched this War Games movie with my kids. There's a lot of swearing in the War Games movie. I forgot. There's a lot of cussing. Um, but a serious game is a game that's designed for a purpose other than entertainment. And there's lots of games. There's lots of serious games. But more importantly, we find that games and game theory create the conditions for the ideal collaboration structure. And if you look at how humans have played games for a long time, you realize that there's a lot of wisdom that we've developed over team structure and team size, and how we interact with gameplay. Now, some of the games that I've designed or, or have leveraged, Product Box, which is about finding unmet needs, Remember the Future, which is goal-driven planning, uh, Spider Web, which understands complex relationships and systems, Start Your Day, uh, which is one of my favorites. It's not used enough. It helps you understand patterns of use of products and services over time. And Speedboat, which a lot of people use in retrospectives, and I'll come back to that. So I looked at the collection of games that we had, and none of these were appropriate for tackling the city's problem. But we do have something called buy a feature. And in buy a feature, you take a set of items that are exceeding your budget, and you give the budget that is available to the participants divided equally. So if I have 20 million euro of cost, and my budget is 8 million euro, and I have eight participants, each participant gets one million euro, and if a project costs two million euro, then people have to collaborate as opposed to compete to get the item. So it's a collaborative market, not a competitive market. Now the city is 100 billion in debt. So I can't walk up to the city, the citizens, and say, you have to, have this money to solve this problem because they don't have any money. So we did what game designers do. We modded the game. And I modded the game in the following way. We created green sheets. Green sheets represent the desirable things that the citizens can invest in. But there's no money. So we had red sheets. Red sheets represented explicit cuts to the city's budget that would free up money to fund the programs in the green. And we actually always recommend in the in-person sessions to actually print money, physical money. It helps reinforce that people are psychologically dealing with money and paper money is the best way to do that. Now to give you an idea of the kinds of things that we're talking about, it's funny, 
I love it when product owners get wrapped around the axle of like, oh my God, my backlog is going to be prioritized. And they're worrying about the color of the font. Let's look at what the citizens of San Jose were dealing with. Do you want to fight graffiti, which we know contributes to gang violence? Would you like to maintain the streets? Or would you like to fund the thing for the children's health? And oh, by the way, you can't fund them all. And how do I get that money? Would you like to eliminate the police helicopter? Would you like to reduce the number of people in the fire truck from five to four, saving a substantial amount of money, but laying off fire uh, safety professionals? So it's really, it helps me. Uh, of course, I agonize over my backlog. Um, by the way, there's actually more than a backlog in Agile. I just published a post yesterday. There's a backlog, a dream log, and a black log. And you should understand the difference between those. These are pretty important things that the city is dealing with. Now, to pull this off, you can't collaborate on these topics by having a room like this. This is not a collaborative experience. This is a broadcast experience, and that's okay. The structure is broadcast. But collaboration requires a few other conditions, especially around topics that are of this complexity. First, you have to group people in, in groups of five to eight because humans do not collaborate larger in larger groups. Second, you need facilitators to guide the collaboration. In sports, we call them referees. In, in these situations, we call them facilitators. And this group of facilitators donated their time and all of this work that we've been doing has been completely pro bono. So we've given over a million dollars of services collectively to the city of San Jose in this work. So it's pretty exciting work. And there's just normal people up here. Um, some Agilists that are a little more well known in, in the States. So this is what it looks like at the event. And you can see that there's a facilitator, Brett uh, McAllen, and you can see uh, the participants. Now you're probably wondering, well, who were these people? The way San Jose is structured, and I think it's somewhat similar to how Vienna is structured, is that there's a city and there are districts. So there's 10 districts in San Jose, and each district is further divided into neighborhoods. And the neighborhoods have specific associations. So we find that those association leaders tend to be very active and we wanted to invite them in because we knew that they were active. And then there were about 100 people in the room. We also included the Youth Commission so that we could have voices. So we had uh, representation from 16-year-old uh, to 87. And we also had subject matter experts. Now, the subject matter experts were people like the fire chief. So when the citizens had a question, what happens if we remove a person from the fire truck we had a complex signaling device, a red paper plate taped to a stick that we would raise, and they would come over and talk to us. Now, here's the results. And what we found was out of these tables, the San Jose residents chose pavement maintenance. So when I was presenting the results to the mayor, the mayor and I were talking, he said, are these results like real? Yeah, they're real. This is what the citizens chose. Do you know how radical this is? No, I don't know how, ra how radical is it? He said, look, we know as the city council that we have to invest in infrastructure and we know that we need to make some improvements in the streets in San Jose. But if we say as a city council that we're going to invest in pavement over libraries, the friends of library, the people who promote libraries, will come out in force. And what we need is pavements. We've got enough libraries. And he said, Luke, there's no friends of pavement. And he said, do you know what I mean? I said, yeah, I work in software. There's no friends of infrastructure. I get it. <laughs> but I understand. What was the impact of this? Well, this is a six-month-long uh, six process, and so we started in January, so it took a little bit of time. And you might think, oh, six months to plan a city budget. Well, this is a $3.5 billion budget. It needs a little time to, to, to settle. 
what they did implement reductions in these areas. And of course, being an Agilist, I managed to talk them into doing a real-time retrospective at the event, which was never done before. And what did the retrospective say? What did the citizens say? Oh, I'm sorry, before we get there, what we learned was that this works, right? We, we learned that we can take the techniques pioneered in the Agile community and accomplish something much bigger, much broader, much grander, which is really exciting. I now say, look, if all you want to build is a better software, that's great, but it's no longer enough for me. I want a better world. And so the citizens in our retrospective said, we love this. Let's do it again. What about adding ideas? And what about a sales tax? Instead of just cutting, maybe we should raise revenue. So we did it again in 2012. We added an item for a sales tax. We created more complex items about funding, and we even added a write-in candidate for the citizens at the table where they could submit their ideas about how to make the city a better place. And it worked great. Now, I'm gonna see if I can pull off a little video because sometimes people look at me and think I'm nuts because they're like, what's collaboration at scale look like? Well, you're, he still thinks I'm nuts. Um, but you know, let's see if we can see what this looks like. All right, so that gives you a sense of the kind of what's going on. If, if you want to see more videos, uh, the city has subsequently videoed every year, and you can see how it's evolved and grown over the years. Um, in many, I think Lisa Adkins was mentioned earlier. Lisa's a friend. She's also taken the Innovation Games class, and I was saying I want to form a nonprofit to continue this work so that people are clear that it's explicitly nonpartisan and we're after civic engagement. But I didn't have a name, and Lisa gave me this name, Every Voice Engaged Foundation, which has been very exciting for us. And this is our nonprofit that continues this work. Now, in 2013, we expanded. So we had a smaller room. In, in the first years, it was a room just a little bigger than this. So we expanded so we get even more people. And um, uh, we also started to expand in Europe. Uh, Europe. This is Jurgen de Smit in Belgium. And he runs co-learning, and he's a terrific facilitator. And he took this technique, and he's now bringing it into Belgium. And we've also worked with Lublin, Poland, and a few other places in Europe, and a few other cities in America. And of course, he points out that Americans would get a better result if we had the same kind of beverages that Europeans do. I think he's right, um, and, I, and I would like to you know, encourage that. Now what about going online? Now keep in mind that every year that this was going on, I kept saying to the city, you know, we have an online platform that allows you to collaborate at scale, and the city would say, oh, you know, we don't want to do that. In 2014, the city came to me and said, you know, do you have an online platform that would allow us to collaborate at scale? I said, wow, it's funny you ask. I'm glad you did. <laughs> it turns out we do. So this is an example of the, the, the items. And you can see it's got like fire engine, it's hard to see, but fire engine company, people are given money, we distribute it, et cetera, et cetera. And they, and they collaborate on the online platform. Now, what did the San Jose residents think about the online platform, right? Because we have this experience of going in person and now we're going in person and, yes, and, yes, in person and online. David. Un, by the way, these are unedited chats. Interesting exercise. I've done it in person at City Hall once before. Worked very similarly. This is better than the in-person game. Hmm. What did you like more about it, Gene? Not noisy. Could hear everyone. Real-time updates of the balances. I could keep track of others. No side chatter. Better focus on task. It came down to the facts. No body language. No prejudices. Just ideas in dealing. So when you're sitting down across the table and that person has, you know, a different colored hair or wearing a turban or doing, you know, some other thing that doesn't look like you, how does that affect you? When we go online, that's removed. And especially in something as complex about budget negotiations, you want to focus on the ideas. So this is pretty exciting to me. And we've been able to validate that in certain circumstances, online interaction, online collaboration really does in fact produce better results. Now this is really hard for the Agile community, right? Because we get a lot of pointy-haired people running around saying teams need to be co-located in Agile. 
They need to be co-located. But they need a lot of them to scale. We have to scale Agile. Well, you can't scale teams. I know that, so we have to have a lot of them, and they're going to be distributed. I just thought you said everyone had to be co-located. Hmm. So we believe in yes and. We believe that you need to find ways to have multidimensional collaboration, both in person and online, because we need this even when it conflicts with some consultant's way of making money. We need to deal with the reality of the world as the world presents itself to us. That's what we have to deal with as Agilists. So what we've learned over the years is that you can repeatedly use these techniques. And what we found in San Jose, for example, is we were able to pick up homelessness as a trend before other techniques were because the citizens were talking about their concerns. So you can use these trends repeatedly. And if you don't think someone's opinion matters to you, let me give you a story of one of the tables uh, from 2014. We, there was a set of items. There was a youth participant. She was very quiet. And the adults were basically doing all the wheeling and dealing. And finally, near the very end, the facilitator said to the, to the youth, this girl who was 16, she said, you've been very quiet. But you have the same amount of money, you have the same voice, you have the same power in this forum as everyone else. What's important to you? And quietly she said, well, I'm not an adult and I know you want to fund libraries and community centers and things like that, but if I wear the wrong clothing on my way to school, I could get shot. And I don't have enough money to fund the anti-gang violence effort, but that's what my neighborhood needs. The table goes stone cold silent. Two of the women who are moms start crying because they realize that they're from the most affluent part of the city and this girl was from the least affluent part of the city. And they instantly changed all of their allocation of money to represent what was really important at that moment for that table. So yeah, you can really make a difference. Now over the years, the citizens came to us and said, you know, we're kind of tired of cutting. It's always budget cut, 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 right? Now by the way, I want to point out that in the last five years, we helped the city go from $100 million in debt to a $6 million surplus. And we're not the only part of that. There's a lot of people who did a lot of hard work, but we helped them by getting the data necessary to make decisions. But the citizens were tired about cutting. So they said, how can you help us grow? Do you have any games that help people grow or help products grow? I said, well, of course we do. We have games that deal with how the product should grow and we probably can apply them to a city. So there, we can make things look like what we want. So we have a game called Prune the Product Tree. Some of you may be familiar with it. We represent a product or service as a tree and we talk about how it grows. So we usually bust it up into different time horizons. We have apples that represent tasty features. I expose the roots because we do want to know what the infrastructure is that's nurturing those tasty features. And we can apply this to the city. And in fact, you see a lot of different versions of prune the product tree on the net. This one right here, for example, is from a team at Oracle that posted their experience in using prune the product tree. Here is a company about how they're going to grow their use of Agile within their company and their transformation. There's lots of different ways to use this. So we actually, oh, we've, uh, a, a side point, we've actually gone online with the Scrum Alliance. The Scrum Alliance a few years ago asked me to do some research with Scrum, uh, certified Scrum trainers about how to grow the Scrum Alliance. So we started with a base tree and then we had five unique forums and we preserve the same concept in online as in person. So if in person is three to eight because that's human biology, online is three to eight because that's human biology. And then by running multiple forums, we can download the data and analyze across the data for patterns. So it's not big data, it's human data and that's important. We did this with the city, both in person and online, in a project that we called the Great Neighborhoods Project in 2013. And we were able to let citizens talk about how they want their city to grow. Pretty powerful stuff. And what we found was the techniques for road mapping 
can now apply to city road mapping. How can our city evolve, change, grow? We've even expanded it more into a process called full participatory budgeting, where the citizens in District 3 were given $100,000 directly by the city under the citizens' control. The citizens created ideas, the citizens shaped them into proposals, and the citizens selected the proposals. This involves a well-known process for innovation, divergent thinking, shaping or sense-making, and convergent thinking. And along the way, this brings into some things that are really critical uh, that even reference some of the stuff that Christian was talking about. Collaboration as the foundation, but notice that creativity. What am I going to come up with ideas? Critical thinking. How are these ideas good? Are they feasible? Are they cost effective? Can we do it in the time frame allotted? Collaboration. How do we work together to pick the best ideas? Now, I can't speak to the school systems in Europe, but in America, we have a thing called 21st century skills. And those 21st century skills are these skills. This is what we want to teach our children because this is what they need in the modern workplace. So I have four kids, I have four great kids, and we have a middle school. So I, again, I don't know enough about European school structures, but in America we do elementary, then middle and then high school, and then uh, university. So middle school is about um, uh, 10th grade, or I'm sorry, 10 years old to about 13 years old. And I said, I'm sitting down at dinner, I said, you know, we've been having this great result at San Jose, Let's give the kids at the school $500 under their control and make the school a better place. And of course, my wife said, hmm, dad has one of his ideas. I said, hey, wait a minute. And I, one of my sons, Cress, was in school. I said, Cress, give me one idea real quick to make the school a better place. He said, oh, dad, that's easy. We've got two lunch lines, but they both serve food and drink. If there's a third lunch line that only serves drinks, People like me who bring my lunch could have more time for play and be more efficient. And I look at my wife and I said, okay. And she said, fine, that's a good idea. And I said, yes, he's an operational engineer. <laughs> so we, and, but then of course the adults, the adults were scared, right? What if the kids choose a pizza party? And I said, well, then we pay the pizza party. It's the kid's choice. So using our online platform, we organized each room in the school, so there's an abstract map of the school, and each room where the kids gather, their homeroom, got a chance to add ideas as a group. And they added things like the half pipe and a pond, some silly stuff, but there was some really interesting ideas. And you want to know what the kids picked? A water bottle refilling station replacement for the current drinking fountain. Because they wanted to be more green and have a place to fill up their water bottles that they bring to school. None of the adults picked this, and the adults agreed that they wouldn't have thought of it. It was so successful that we are in the middle of the ideation phase right now, and the kids have been given $1,000 as opposed to 500 Pretty cool. Now, are you a Monopoly butt? Does anyone play Monopoly here? Monopoly, you see a bunch of hands. Okay, wow, you're raising hands. They didn't even ask you to. Very cool. Um, what happens when you land on free parking? When you're, when you're playing Monopoly, what do you do? You get 200. You get 200 when, when you land on free parking. Anyone else? What happens? When you land on Monopoly, when you're playing Monopoly, what happens when you land on free parking? What does free parking mean? What does free parking mean? If you don't know the game, it means... Oh, your version? <laughs> okay. Does anyone else? Well, what, what most people do is they, they, the money that the bank collects, when you land on this square, you get the money. But it turns out, what are you supposed to do when you land on that square according to the rules? Nothing. So what's interesting about this is that there's the rules of a game called Monopoly and that people ignore the rules. They're a Monopoly butt. What, but they're really not a monopoly butt. They're a game designer. Now, 
There's a woman, Amy Cootie, who's talked and researched about body language and how it affects us. And she says that when you're taking on a new task, if you assume the superhero pose, you can tackle that task better. So, what we've established is that when you change the rules of a game, you are a game designer. And all humans change the rules of the games they play. We are all game designers. But you may not realize that you're a game designer, and you may not realize the superpower you have as a game designer. So the way we're going to leverage this superpower is you're going to stand up. You're going to introduce yourself to the person next to you, but you're going to do it this way. You're going to assume the superhero pose. You're going to say, hello, my name is... And I am a game designer. Can, can, you, can you feel that superpower right now? Because if you're going to do, if you guys are going to take an agile transformation on in your company, you're going to need that superpower. Here's why. Scrum has the definitive guide to Scrum, and it says the rules of the game. And yet, you get a lot of, have you heard the term Scrum butt? Yeah, huh. Well, if Scrum's a game, and I am a game designer, don't I have the right to modify the game? Hmm, I say Scrum butts unite. Change the rules of Scrum. Add things like roadmaps. You need more, to me, you need more than a backlog to manage your work. You actually need a roadmap, right? So. But that's not Scrum, so I'm a Scrum butt. Maybe you're a Scrum butt. Or a game designer, <laughs> depending on how you want to call it. So keep calm, Scrum mod on. Now, the, the question is, if, if you accept that we have these ideas of mods, and you can see some of the mods that we've done in business and applied them to, to social problems, the question becomes, how far can we push the mod? Well. We did some programs with some organizations, uh, some school systems, like what kind of school programs we should fund. Very classic application of buy a feature. But we got a different problem. How do we deal with school overcrowding? Now, when I present that question to you, think about what happens into your mind. When I say to you, how should we allocate tax revenue? You're thinking relatively rationally about, well, what are my options and how much do they cost and how are we going to allocate money? But when I say, how do I deal with school overcrowding? Your first question isn't, how do I spend money? Your first question is, what are my options to spend money on? How could I approach this problem? And that's a different kind of thinking. And it illustrates the difference between technical problems, things like budgets and roadmaps, in which they're fairly clearly defined. They have shorter, often repeating time horizons. We, we have periodic releases or monthly budgeting cycles. Failure isn't catastrophic because you get to do over, right? You, you get another turn at the cycle. And it's very knowledge and economics driven. And problems like urban planning which have long time horizons. They span, they span an administration. There's inertia. We've been doing things this way for a while. And, but the problem with the inertia is that failure is catastrophic. When we were working with the school district, the reality is the kids are coming. And you may not see those kids for six years, but you can look at the birth rate and you know those kids are coming. You have to deal with it. Failure is catastrophic. There's multiple actors which contributes to the inertia, and it's very values driven, not very economic driven. And these are wicked problems, and they exist at all levels of society, from urban planning within a city to where I live, there's a drought, which is a terrible, wicked problem, to in America, we have uh, health care and, of course, immigration reform, which who knows what's going to happen, um, to societal problems, right? IBM is now saying that 40% of knowledge worker jobs are going to be automated through cognitive community, computing. How do we prepare our children for 
a world that's different? How do we have jobs for them? There is a massive worldwide epidemic of opiate use, and it's getting worse as the designer drugs get more powerful. And the thing that we export in America that makes me the saddest is obesity. Do we really want our children to have shorter lives with less health than what we have had? I don't think so. At least I hope not. Now, you look at this and you think, oh, do we have wicked problems in business? And if we have wicked problems in business, could we apply those solutions to society? Well, I think we do have wicked problems in business. Late software, how do I deal with my late software? There's trivial reactions. We'll talk about ways to deal with it. Massive tech debt or low adoption rates or how to scale agile it makes you want to go, ah, again. So we think, well, let's look at business. Well, it turns out that we can't help. Not this time. Research in truly strategic, wicked problem solving in business shows that businesses fail 50% of the time in solving wicked problems. 50% of the time we fail. I'm not talking the small problems, I'm talking like the really big problems. Like, my expansion in Brazil isn't going well, what do I do? And we fail, not because we're not smart, because most of the time we don't use the right process. We don't create actual options and we don't assess causal system dynamics. And what causal system dynamics means is that for these actions there are drawbacks. And I need to understand how I feel about those actions and drawbacks because I can't predict them. It's a wicked problem. If I could predict it, I'd run a simulation and I'd pick the best option. But I can't. Hmm. So maybe we should look the other way. Maybe there's ways of attacking social problems that could help us in business. So a few years ago, I was at South by Southwest, a pretty big conference in America, talking about our work with budget games, and I met Amy Lee from the Kettering Foundation. Now, the Kettering Foundation is an institution that studies democracy around the world and seeks to improve democratic practices around the world. And they have found that the most effective means to engage citizens in problem solving is through something that they call a deliberative forum, where you bring citizens into a room and they discuss, in a collaborative manner, the options, actions, and drawbacks of how to attack a given problem. Now, let's look at this from the perspective of the California drought. And you can understand drought even if you don't understand California. One option is creating or capturing more water. Right? I could, I could drill deeper, for example, get more water from the ground. Another water, another, I'm sorry, another technique is I could increase conservation. And you'll notice that these are kind of opposing, right? Using more water and saving more water are kind of opposing. But to really understand a wicked problem, I need a third option. I need a way to look at that wicked problem from a completely different perspective. In California, there's no state law that governs water rights or water use. Everyone can kind of do their own thing. And that's part of the biggest problem is that there's no management of the water. Now let's look at some actions for this. I could build desalination plants for capturing more water or creating water. I could change the levees to control how water is organized or distributed. Or I could build a new reservoir. So now you might think, does anyone think these sound like good ideas? Like, yeah, you should do that. Does it sound at first glance like that's a good idea? Yeah, maybe. Build a reservoir? Sounds like a good idea. But for each of these actions, there's an inherent drawback. So the question becomes, can you accept the drawback? Well, desalination plants produce pretty nasty wastewater. The levees could harm an ecosystem of which powers one of the biggest agricultural uh, 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 um, economies in America. And reservoirs actually cost a lot and don't save as much money as you, or save as much water as you think. And this is what we mean by looking at not just actions, but the drawbacks of those actions. 
So Kettering came to me and said, can you build software that scales deliberation? And for those of you who've been friends of mine in the Agile community, you might have noticed that for about a year and a half, I dropped out of the Agile community. I stopped giving talks at conferences, I stopped writing, because I had one of those moments where this was the only time in my life that I could build this software. So I'm gonna drop out of Agile, I'm gonna go do this, and I'll come back maybe. And so we did this. We kind of stopped development of innovation games, we stopped development, and we went full out on building a new software platform to attack wicked problems. Here's a very small set of screenshots because I want to show where it goes. The, the idea is that you have a set of actions and you rank simply, I think we should do this action, I'm conflicted, or I think we should not. And the specific action is California should increase production and use of recycled water. I'm, and by the way, this is my choice. I said, yep, I'm totally fine with getting more recycled water. There's a drawback to recycled water. And the drawback is some people have a hard time of getting over the ick factor. Options to recycled water projects has coined the term toilet to tap, which makes it hard to overcome, right? Literally, in the toilet, recycle, come out the tap. Are you okay with that? You may or may not be. I'm okay with that. So I mark, I can live with this. Now, this is done individually to understand how you value things. But remember, we know that surveys suck, and especially about these complex values. So what our software does now is it builds a visualization of the group's opinion, and the moderator now engages in a discussion. No one knows what the other people's answers are, but if in that discussion, you change your mind because of what's being said, this visualization will dynamically adjust. So you can literally see the conversation change. And when we're done, we can see all of the options together. And this is actually a fairly common picture because when it's a values-driven wicked problem, you're not gonna have complete and trivial and easy agreement, but you can find what needs to exist for a foundation for action on a common problem or a wicked problem. So what we found now is that there are techniques used to tackle social problems that we can apply in business. Like technical debt. Let's look at technical debt. First, I'm pissed off about technical debt because you have less technical debt than you claim. You have crappy collaboration. Because technical debt is how you scare the product manager to get off the feature treadmill and let you do infrastructure. Remember kids, it wasn't called agile first, it was called incremental iterative development. So let's look at it. What are my options for dealing with massive technical debt? There's a software architect who worked for me, Ron Lundy, and he coined Ron Lundy's Lundy's Law. Lundy's Law says, given enough time, any development team will justify a total rewrite. <laughs> so you have these developers running around to the business leaders. Ooh, we have massive technical debt. And as a business leader, I think, wow, you're just admitting that you've completely done everything wrong purposefully for a long time. Huh. I'm supposed to give you a raise? Hmm. So as a business leader, what's my option? First thing I'm going to think of is get rid of those pesky developers. I'm just going to go buy it off the shelf. But I contend that neither of those simplistic choices for dealing with technical debt is the right choice. And the right choice is to build a collaborative roadmap that balances market growth with technical infrastructure so that you can actually pull yourself out of the technical debt working together with the business. What about scaling agile? That's a hot topic, right? Ooh, gotta scale, gotta scale. What are your options? Well, you could hire a bunch of consultants they love that, spend millions of dollars, woohoo! Or you could skip the consultants, take longer, and do your own retrospectives and figure out how to get there on your own. 
It's going to take longer, right? The consultants accelerate, but it costs money. It might take longer. But in reality, what's the third option for scaling Agile? Well, you have to actually start with your architecture. Because if your architecture isn't designed to scale, all that other stuff isn't going to work either. So we actually have to have these kinds of conversations at the architecture level. So what I'm presenting to you is that the experiences that you have as Agilists and the skills and the values that you have around collaboration can be applied to much, much bigger things. Now, what other kinds of opportunities can we create? Well, the Agile Manifesto says at regular intervals, the team reflects on how it's doing to move forward and be better. Scrum says you do it every sprint, but the Agile Manifesto doesn't. The Agile Manifesto says it's regular intervals. Now, one of the more common techniques uh, for doing retrospectives is speedboat. There's a lot of pictures of speedboat on the net. And you can tell that this is obviously single teams co-located, but what if you need to scale? What we find consistently in organizations is that retrospectives have the following shape, especially at sale. When you first start Agile, people are doing retrospectives and they love it. Oh, this is really great. And they get a lot of value of retrospectives because they're learning how to work as a team. The second phase is they can actually make some improvements that are exciting. But the third phase is where things start to get a little dicey. And think about a team. Let's say, let's say you're working in an organization with a, a moderately sized organization, 30 scrum teams or 40 scrum teams. And some of our clients have as many as 1,000 scrum teams. So let's say you're working 20, 30 scrum teams. What you're going to find is that you're going to hit this phase, which is no one team can impose changes on the other teams. There's an organizational limit. And what often happens is you get into the why bother stage. You go, ooh. Because why should I bother with a retrospective when we always complain about the same things and the same things never get fixed? So there's two issues here. One, you haven't scaled retrospectives. And two, you're doing your retrospective too frequently. Because once you get all of the easy stuff done, kids, the only thing that's left is the hard stuff. And the hard stuff doesn't get fixed in a single two-week sprint. So what we need to do is we need to scale retrospectives. Now, the way that we do this is we have people go online. And each team does a speedboat. We download the data and we analyze it. Now, we have BWIN here as a, uh, a sponsor. BWIN is also a client. And they asked me to undertake a retrospective, you'll hear more about it later, with their team in India. 42 scrum teams. Each dot represents either an anchor on the boat, something that slows you down, or a propeller, something that helps you go fast. And what we found was that the teams themselves had gelled and were cooking, but there were, in fact, some opportunities for improvement in the enterprise. And those enterprise, those enterprise opportunities transcended any one team. That's pretty exciting. So what would it happen if we were to take some of these techniques into a larger place? Now, I've been talking about scale, but maybe I've been going the wrong way. What, what if we made it smaller and we talked about the most important social unit of all time, which is our families? Last year, a book was published. Out of the blue, I get this email saying, hey, we're about to publish a book. We are taking all of your games and we're applying them to family systems therapy. So for those of you who know the game 2020, where you're ranking priorities, they, these are family system therapists who are working with alcoholics to rank their priorities for recovery in a collaborative manner with their family using innovation games. This is Remember the Future for people with gambling addictions on how to overcome their gambling addiction. Completely blew me away. Completely blew me away. And part of the reason it blew me away is when you're an author, you don't know how people are going to use your work. And when you're a game designer, you don't know how things are going to end up. Remember the story of Monopoly? 
Do you know why Monopoly was created? It was created by a woman to teach the dangers of uh, usurious lending. So, and it became a game that was the exact opposite, right? So it's pretty pow powerful what this can do. So now what? I'm at the end of my talk, now what? You're sitting there, now what? You might think about this, you think, gosh, I don't know, Luke, I don't think I can do what you're talking about because this sounds like you gotta be some kind of collaboration superhero. Well, when you look at the Avengers, okay, granted, the green dude, he's you know, genetically modified. There's also a god. There's the smartest engineer who's ever lived. And there's another dude who's genetically modified. So maybe you're thinking, I can't do this. But if you look closely, there's two people who are relatively normal. There's Hawkeye who has no fear, and there's a badass ballerina. Really, she's a ballerina. She's just pretty tough. So you can become like these people, agilists, facilitators who became collaboration superheroes just because they were willing to contribute to their communities. So my request to you is to play two games to make the world a better place, to change the world. And those two games don't have to be outside. They can be inside your company. They, any problem that you want, just play two serious games to change the world. That's my request. I'm going to give you a little help in implementing that request. Because if you run up to your boss and say, hey, let's play a game, your boss might say, we don't play games here. So I'm going to teach you how to say, let's play a game in boss speak. Because remember that way back in the beginning of the deck, I talked about what the elements of a game were? So I'm going to teach you how to say, let's play a game in boss speak. Are you ready? You're going to say, boss, I want to engage my team in a goal-directed activity with clearly defined rules of engagement. Progress towards achievement of the goal will be tracked through clearly communicated status indicators. <laughs> Pretty good, huh? Now, you're thinking, Luke, you don't know my boss. I got to spice it up. I got the spice for you. You're going to say strategic. <laughs> no one knows what it means, but it excites them. And you say, Luke, you have no idea of the place that I work. If there is even a hint of enjoyment you know, we gotta work harder. So we're gonna change activity to exercise. <laughs> Finally, you're in this room, it's the Agile Tour. You work for an Agile company. So you're saying, Luke, if I don't have something that sounds cool with Agile, my boss is not gonna go for it. I'm like, I got the thing for you. You're gonna call it an information radiator. <laughs> Present this to your boss, and you will be playing games all day. <laughs> now, I'm from Silicon Valley, which means we have to have a stupid curve. Do you know what stupid curves are? Stupid curves look like that. <laughs> so I, I built this curve with the starting condition from uh, the Agile conference where there were 2,500 people. And if everyone in that room played two games a year, and there were five participants per game with a 10% conversion rate, I figured in 25 years, we'd have more than 300, pe 300 million people around the world playing games, which I think might be enough to make the world a better place. And you need to do this because the world needs you. Thank you. <laughs>